That was the kindest version of I dropped out of college that I ever heard. <laughs> I left early. Um, but I am a big believer in education, as I tell everybody. I mean, I really, really am. I, I spent the best five years of my life as a freshman. So um, I was asked to come and talk about some of the technology and some of the projects I've worked on and some of the things I hope to do with some of these technologies around the world. But I also i am really here on a mission to get more support for FIRST. So I decided I need to race through some history of what we've done, just show some examples so you won't think I'm completely crazy, stuff that really worked. And then I'll show you a couple of projects that haven't worked yet. As you heard, we did make uh, the first insulin pump. That picture probably doesn't impress too many people here. You're all carrying a piece of electronics about that size. What should impress you, if anything, is that picture is about 32 years old. I don't know how many people here could show me a 32-year-old iPhone or a PC, but I was building those for my older brother, who was actually down here at Yale, not too far from here, and um, he was using versions of that for delivering chemotherapy to babies until we started making ones that would deliver insulin for diabetics. Um, it later turned into pretty good size business, and to this day they build pumps that don't look uh, much different than that. And I was building those when I probably should have been studying some useful high school subject. But um, anyway, um, my brother didn't want to wait. Uh, he was a med student at the time. Um, this is a home dialysis machine. Typically, if a person loses their ability, if their kidneys stop working, until we started making these machines for home use, almost everybody in this country and around the world that lost their kidney function would have to spend every other night for the rest of their life living in a dialysis center watching their blood being pumped around an extracorporeal circuit. It's not pretty. We decided we could build a little box that could be put in somebody's home, literally next to a nightstand, and a little cartridge could be put in every day or every night when they go to bed, and they could dialyze themselves, unplug themselves in the morning, and go off to work. The advantages were pretty obvious if you could do it. It's way more comfortable for the user. They do it at home, in their own bedroom. They have their dignity and their comfort. They can do it every night, not every other night, because it's available and it's cost effective, and so they feel much better. And for all sorts of reasons, being able to live in your own house and run your life was you know, a very valuable aspiration, but most people told us we were crazy to try to make a machine that could do that. Soon after we made that machine, it was launched, and within a couple of years, it became uh, sort of the standard of care. And last March, we shipped the 150 millionth therapy for that machine, and they now have them pretty much all over the world. But we made this. It took us 10 years. And when we were done, some of our engineers were saying, wait a minute. If we take the seat off it and take that cluster off it and just leave all that everything we spent so much time learning how to do and understand building solid state gyro control systems, we could get rid of that seat and, and make a device that the rest of the world would like. And it's called a Segway. And we did that. But even that came from one of our medical products. But just to show you how people judge things, within weeks after that Segway came out, I've forever been known as the Segway guy. So that shows you, you devote your life to all sorts of other things, and you never can predict what's going to happen. There would be Mr. Bush, and, uh, and, and behind him is a Segway. And uh, a couple of years ago, um, I got a call from his father, the 41st president of the United States, who said he and Barbara Bush were up in their place in Maine, not too far from here, 
and they'd love to have some segues for the Father's Day weekend because their kids and grandkids and great grand everybody was showing up and they were all excited. So I brought a couple of segues over there and just as I was leaving, Barbara Bush said to me, oh, I'm so excited with everybody coming, they're going to have a great time. And I said, Mrs. Bush, please, don't let all these kids just jump on these machines without any training, without any judgment, somebody's going to get hurt. I had no idea which kid would jump on the machines. And, <laughs> but this picture was the front page of about every newspaper in the country, and in fact, around the world the next day. And I'm getting calls from everybody I know saying, Dean, I thought you said people don't fall off those things. <laughs> well, they work a lot better if you turn them on before you jump on them. <laughs> but, but, but as you can see, he didn't fall down. He's very agile. And he did, as you'll see, continue the great tradition of being another one of the presidents that does invite all of our first winners to the White House. So no real harm there. This is a picture looking out my window about 90 miles from here in Manchester. The machine on the right is a vapor compression distiller. It'll make 50 of those jugs down next to it, 20 liter jugs, and make 1,000 liters of pure distilled water a day off of about as much electricity as a handheld hair dryer. It requires no chemicals, no membranes, no disposables, because around the world they don't have that stuff. It does, however, need a little bit of electricity. So the box on the left makes a few thousand watts of electricity, but again, around the rest of the world, they can't run down to the Exxon station at the corner. So that Stirling cycle generator runs on any source of heat. It doesn't need any refined fuel of any kind. In fact, we put two of those machines in Bangladesh and for 24 weeks, nearly half a year, those machines ran on just the methane gas that was evolving off of a little pile of cow dung sitting next to the machine. And from that cow dung, we literally electrified that village and helped clean it up. In fact, we'll show you some pictures. That's the village in Bangladesh where we have the machine in the background there, one of the two villages. Here's a village in Honduras down in Central America. After one week, those machines were supplying, as I said, a thousand liters of pure water a day and all the kids would come and collect those supplies of water every day on their way to school and not surprisingly, the rate of sickness dramatically fell. So we spent slightly over one year and got to that, which weighs less than the original equipment, a real arm. And in less than three months of figuring out how to attach it to a guy that has no arms, that's our controls guy. And next to him, behind him, is one of my other engineers who also on the side happens to be a surgeon. Now, you're going to watch Chuck move all those joints simultaneously and control them, and this is after only 10 hours of training. He's, in the second, going to demonstrate he can pick up a little piece of rubber the size of a ping pong ball and transfer it to another guy that lost his arm. In a minute, he's going to do something I can't do. I'm very jealous. He's going to pick up a spoon, hold it level, and take some cereal out of a bowl, hold it level without dropping any milk at all and eat it. As he was doing that, his wife was standing behind me. Here he goes. And she says, Dean, Chuck hasn't fed himself in 19 years, so you got a choice. We keep the arm or you keep Chuck. <laughs> now Chuck just picked up a grape, didn't break it, didn't drop it, and he's going to rotate all those joints simultaneously and eat it which is what the Department of Defense asked us for.